my experience on uh, with MRI and Wilson disease is based on our clinic, which we had been running for last 40 years now, and a registry of more than 700 patients. Currently, we have about 125 to 150 who are regular on follow-up. We have close to 34 peer-reviewed publications in Wilson's. <coughs> now, when we see the CT scans, it has got a limited role in Wilson's disease, but nevertheless, like many patients with uh, neurological undergo CT scan and we can find some degree of hypoatrophy or hypodensities mainly restricted to the basal ganglia region. Now all of you, most of you are gastroenterologists and uh, liver specialists. So if you do brain MRI in patients with hepatic form of Wilson disease, this is a part of basal ganglia known as globus pallidus this will be white or hyper intense and that is said to be because of manganese. So this is the reason of having T1 hyper intensity, we don't call it, uh, uh, why it is because of uh, manganese. In the other neurological form of Wilson disease, we find a various combination of T2 hyper intensity or T1 hyper intensity and this combination of in pallidum and basal ganglia, the combination of hyper and hyper is mainly a very highly suggestive of Wilson's. And conventional neuro Wilson's, the changes are because of necrosis, cystic changes, gliosis, and copper accumulation. This was our initial experience of 100 patients of MRI who underwent over four years. We had a project in which Dr. Prashant was working as a project officer after he joined as a neurology residency at our place. And that time <coughs> we found that this we compared with other studies and uh, you see that like putamen, globus pallidus, thalami, caudate, white matter, midbrain, these were the signal changes. So we will see now several examples of that. This is putamen, this is thalamus and this is caudate. This is putamen, this is thalamus, there is a dilatation of the ventricle. Again caudate, putamen. So this is some kind of what we call as bright claustral sign this bright claustral sign. This is thalamus and then with chronicity, iron deposits and you get hypointensity in the pallidum. This is grades of atrophy. So you can see a lot of spaces in the brain. So there is a diffuse atrophy, there is a focal atrophy and there is a brainstem and cerebellar atrophy. Then you can see the more florid basal ganglia both in thalamus, putamen, pallidum and the, then this is the white matter. So Conventionally, Wilson's was thought as a deep gray matter, gray matter disease, but we find a substantial proportion has white matter disease. This is in the midbrain, tectal region. This again, these white matter changes sometimes becomes gliotic, and they, these patients may have seizures. And this is in the brain stem. This is face of giant panda, which is very characteristic. So these white matter changes are not uncommon, they are more in frontal than other lobes. They may also have subtle white matter changes and extensive white matter changes may suggest poor prognosis. Now this is one term known as iron in copper disease, like this black things you are seeing, this is because of iron deposition. Any chronic brain disease nowadays has found to have iron deposition and in Wilson's also it happens early compared to the a similar aged child. This is in the substantia nigra. These are all characteristic, like if you see, so these are very highly suggestive. This is face of giant panda. This is central pontine myelonysis or osmotic demyelination like bright claustrum. And this is that liver uh, when you see hyper intensity in the. Now, we, uh, this is uncommon. We named it as panda with bright eyes. Normally, red nucleus in the midbrain will have dark. So this was a uh, patient in uh, where we found that red nucleus is, is bright, so we called it a dark bright. Then these are some of the other uncommon, like thalamus has this onion pill like appearance. This is known as mini cup sign, this is dorsal midbrain tectal plate changes. Further corpus callosum splenial, middle cerebellar peduncle, U fiber involvement, sometimes cortex, these are all uncommon findings. You may see restricted diffusion in some times, and that's also uncommon finding. We looked into the type of central pontine myelonysis, and this was one term which we coined that time as Mercedes-Benz sign. It's three types of central, sorry, three types of central pontine myelonysis. One like whole coin-like, another it will be slid in between, another is like a tri 
spartite or which we call that time as mercedes benz sign and they are different than the osmotic demyelination what we see in pons and they uh, because it's uh, occurs in the chronic disease without any obvious change in the sodium now mri does also helps us in correlating with neuropsychology sometimes in seizures as we were talking this kind of changes when we see invariably patients does have seizures sometimes very difficult to control by and seizures happen in very less about 6 7% of the patients with wilson's disease we looked into the spectroscopic finding like this mm. mri you can see the chemical uh, display of the brain and generally what we find there is a decrease of choline creatinine compared to the na these are some of the newer techniques i think uh, you all of you may not be aware or interested to know like uh, brain can also be studied variably which eyes cannot see what we call at diffusion tensor imaging this mm. gives a idea of the microstructural changes and we found some problem in both in the drug knife patients and try to follow them also and they these values does improve so uh, the we can mri also has a role other than diagnosing in following that patients like clinical and mri improvement um, happens pari pasu that is along in most patients with neuropsychiatric form liver involvement we can get an additional clue by seeing pallidal signal changes newer tools like dti matrix or ms vmart spectroscopy it improves understanding at the microstructural level extensive mri including white matter changes helps in prognostication this was a study which we did by sequentially like 50 patients and there what was the sequential change with the mri and we found that in majority it improves along with the clinical improvement in some there may be worsening and clinical worsening and mr worsening was also there this was the paper another paper with where we found dti parameters improved so it helps mri does helps to exclude mimickers in addition it assists in deciding tests to exclude other dd and some of the mr findings are almost pathognomonic of wilson disease and one of the common thing is the non wilsonian hepatolenticular degeneration where they have extrapenoidal symptoms and also has uh, doesn't have wilsons and this was a paper in which we looked into the various mri changes of the non wilsonian hepatolenticular degeneration and i'm not going to the detail because they are almost similar like in mid brain or in the putamen so to conclude like uh, ct scan careful interpretation is essential and normal ct scan do not exclude wilson disease we should remember that mri is very useful and often provide a clue if even if it is clinically not suspected hepatic form you may see t1 weighted pallidal hyperintensity it's always abnormal in neurological involved patients the extent and severity of changes are very varied at protean the clinically severe form extensive mri changes common are putamen thalamai caudate midbrain pons and white matter and characteristics are midbrain tectal changes cpm like changes face of giant panda and t1 pa- pallidal hyperintensity means liver frontal white matter and adjacent cortical atrophy seizures may be important thing three types of cpm we had found and this uh, sign we had described first time serial mri improves variably with decoupling therapy in majority and uh, this cpm like changes are different from the osmotic demyelination simultaneous involvement of basal ganglia thalamus and brain stem is almost uh, virtually pathognomonic of wilson disease spectroscopy is a evolving knowledge provide idea about metabolite tensor imaging again additional areas are involved which are not seen by the eyes what is intriguing is this clinical mri discordance like some patients will have a very severe form of and we don't see that much of changes the basis of t- topographic preference of certain areas we do not know and uh, genetic mri correlations have like in the phenotype genetic correlation is very variable uh, genetic mri correlation also has not been studied much so, yeah, i acknowledge uh, my uh, teacher dr tali who we have been working with and this is one patient of wilson's who improved this is a clinic of thank you <coughs> so a couple of uh, just clarifications one is that wh- what is the specificity of these mri changes in terms of wilson's disease if it is neurological wilson disease almost always they will have brain mri changes right second thing what is uh, uh, that i'll mm. complete one more if you are following like if you are seeing the patients who are already on treatment 
the signal changes disappear. Right. Second thing, what you said about MRI spectroscopy choline elevations and also the diffuse tensor imaging. It will be very difficult to say whether this is because of the Wilson's disease or no, because not, of the liver disease. Because these changes are also seen yeah, in minimum hepatic encephalopathy. Nobody whether is it is Wilson's disease per se or because of the MHE due to liver disease. I am not telling these are because yeah. of right. findings. One question. Uh, you have a patient who has a chronic liver disease. Uh, you are not sure whether it is Wilson's. Uh, do you add MRI? And then you find some hyperintensity in T1. Uh, the radiologist says, I'm not sure whether this implies manganese or a copper. Uh, how do you take copper it from there? Copper per se doesn't cause any uh, intensity. It should be only T2. Copper <coughs> secondarily cause changes in the brain by brain injury and that causes. So if you have pure hepatic and along with that, if you find T2 hyperintensity, that may indicate that yes, this is with such uh, okay. uh, finding T1 hyperintensity in the pallidum only reflects this uh, hepatic dysfunction. In your opinion, sir, those who are not neuroradiologists, they are other radiologists. Do they to the same accuracy actually no, find sir. out these no, changes? Sir. No, sir. They no. have difficulty. It's a high clinical means you should be knowing what you're looking at. They should be neuroradiologists. Yeah. Actually. Even neuro 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 radiologists also neuro. make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, everyone that, can that, make even mistakes. Even neuroradiologists make mistakes. mistakes. So quite often that we have to give hint. So everywhere we don't find them. Yes, Dr. Vinay. Vinay, one last question, last, I think. Yes. Vinay, last question. Two small things. One, one of the imaging which shows like a toxic uh, encephalopathy, you know, toxic um, uh, leukoencephalopathy, what we see. Uh, which you showed. I saw one case like that. You know, sometimes you wonder what is causing this toxic encephalopathic like picture or leukoencephalopathy. Uh, is it copper? Is it penicillin or something else? Because normally you don't see that that much of white matter changes. You also showed those beautiful pictures. Yeah, one. Uh, <coughs> the we had um, some patients who underwent uh, MRS. No, pathology autopsy. Oh. Uh, about eight patients, unfortunately, di had died in mm. hospital and they had undergone uh, autopsy. I think two patients had some leukoencephalopathy pathology-wise. Yeah. So, Dr. Anita, uh, the pathologist and Dr. Shankar, they uh, did not find any tissue copper. deposition of copper. Yes. So, the pathology was similar to what it was there in basal ganglia. So, it's probably some kind of extensive damage which happened in a subpopulation. Why it happens that we do not know. Okay, you do, don't see. And, uh, uh, you must have seen have four or five cases in last yeah. seven hundred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You must not have seen this, too many uh, of like that. Just now we have completed one <coughs> large uh, genetic study of hundred two families and uh, all of them have undergone MRI. So, we are we now going to do the MRI genetic correlation. Other question is sometimes, you know, patient, I, because I see a lot of dystonic patients. These, they have a severe dystonia and now I want to know imaging base, will they improve? If I see so much of necrosis, unlikely their dystonia will improve. So, uh, on usually we, we know that there is no direct correlation. I think this one direct correlation is if you have a lot of basal ganglia necrosis, that I don't think that I am expecting that dystonia will do a wonderful job. What do you say about that? I mean, there are surprises, I think. Uh, the patients, some of the patients have improved and MRI also has improved, but no, no, if it is necrosis, is cavitation, it won't. Cavitation, yes. So, if there is if there are hypo, hypo, hypo intense signal on T2, yeah. that will tell me these are the patients who will not improve. What do you say? Agreed.